right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're very excited to have you at our webinar today. It is called Cracking the Code, Amazon Seller Guidelines Decoded. Uh, we have three great presenters today, myself included. Uh, my name is Andrew Laird, and I run the customer success team at Mayan. Um, I've been an Amazon seller for about eight years. I've worked on dozens and dozens of different accounts. I've done probably 50 to 60 product launches just over the past uh, 12 months or so. And yeah, we're really excited to share some of our tips and tricks and you know, sort of new things that are coming up on Amazon. We also have Shane Morris with GS1 and Rohit Ayer with Assureful. So I'll let, uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves later. Um, we're first just going to go through the agenda. Um, we're going to talk about the must-know policies for Amazon entrepreneurs. That's going to be my section. I'm going to walk through three different uh, pieces of information that I think are very valuable uh, to understand for Amazon sellers. Um, we're then going to talk about Amazon insurance requirements with Assureful. And then Shane from GS1 is going to talk more about GS1 codes. Um, so we're really excited uh, to, to share this with you. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of the platform. Uh, you can see here, this is what you should be seeing on your screen. You can ask a panelist a question with this box here. We have a chat, main chat box right here, which we have access to. So if you want to you know, just throw in where you're from, if you're an Amazon seller, what types of products you've sold in the past, we'd love to uh, learn a little bit about who's watching right now. Uh, you can also answer a quick survey after the call. And you will also have the ability to book a call with one of our Mayan experts. Um, or claim a free advertising audit. These are you know, free services that we offer if you're interested in learning more about the Mayan PPC engine. Um, next, I just wanted to mention that Mayan just published a free ebook called The Ultimate Guide to Radical FBA Growth. Uh, we worked with three other partners, 8Fig, Gemba, um, and a patent attorney, uh, Rich Goldstein, uh, we have a lot of good information about how to source products, how to launch products, uh, how to advertise for products, and how to reach uh, eight figures, and also how to protect your uh, intellectual property. So again, please use the QR code. This is a free download for now. It is not going to be free forever, so uh, take advantage of it while you can. Okay, so let's see. Drop it into the chat. We have um, any attendees. Looks like some people are still joining in. We had a number of signups, but um, let's uh, let's get started with first, uh, who is Mayan? Mayan is a, we are really the only PPC optimization platform built by MIT data scientists. Our three founders are all from MIT. We have an excellent data science team, and we've really been figuring out the PPC environment on Amazon. As you know, it's so important to really understand and manage your PPC effectively. Amazon has really become a pay to play platform and there is so much sponsored uh, content available that if you're not taking advantage of it, you're certainly gonna get left behind. And I think one of our biggest advantages is that we have customer success managers or account managers that are either Amazon sellers or just have extensive Amazon experience. Um, so we'd love to you know, hear from you, learn more about your business. And we, like I said, we offer free advertising audits. So I've talked a little bit about myself. I'll turn it over to Shane and Rohit to give a quick introduction on uh, their company and themselves. Thank you so much. So my name is Shane Morris and I work for GS1 US. We're a uh, global supply chain standards organization. Um, I'm a business development director there. So we work with, my team works with companies like Mayan. Um, a lot of you all out there today are members of GS1 US, but your trusted advisor are companies like Mayan. So I can kind of bridge that gap. Um, I've got 30 years experience in the retail industry, started pre-internet um, and have gone all the way through. So thanks so much for having me here. Yeah, great to have you, Shane. Thanks. Rohit. Hi, um, I'm Rohit Nair. I'm a founder and CEO of Assureful. Uh, I'm an Amazon seller myself, or was, uh, built four Amazon brands and sold them to private equity and to other aggregators as well. Um, tons of you know 
time spent on Amazon and Shopify, um, and since then launched Assureful. Assureful is an insurance platform uh, which is focused toward e-commerce businesses. Uh, we have built a monthly bill usage-based liability insurance product for Amazon, which is mandatory for Amazon sellers uh, after you cross the threshold, which we'll be talking about later today. So uh, thank you so much, Andrew, and uh, happy to be here. Yeah, thank you both. Really appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to start the first section, must know, must know policies for Amazon entrepreneurs. Um, obviously, we don't have time to talk about you know everything you need to do on Amazon. So I'm really going to focus it on just a few topics today uh, that I think are very beneficial and things that um, you know should be understood by most sellers uh, if you really want to take your business to the next level. Um, and a lot of times, it's always about you know understanding your costs. Um, Amazon costs have been rising across the board for the last few years, and will likely continue to do so. Uh, so what I want to talk about first is Amazon warehouse and distribution. This is not to be confused with FBA. This is a new program through Amazon that acts like a third party uh, logistics company. So if you go back a little bit to pre COVID, I had a, a lot of my, a lot of our customers were, you know, getting large shipments directly from China into Amazon FBA that, that, policy started to really break down during COVID. Uh, there were massive storage limits placed on most Amazon sellers. I experienced this uh, with, with many of my products. It was very frustrating. We couldn't get the inventory into FBA that we needed to cover even just a few months. Um, so it made it impossible to send all of your inventory directly to Amazon FBA. So a lot of customers, including myself, um, started using 3PLs, which again, those are expensive. It's another line item uh, on your bill every month. Uh, their storage is off, often quite expensive. Um, and it just, you know, it's another, it's another uh, piece of the business that you can theoretically optimize. So um, Amazon Warehouse and Distribution uh, offer, offers a much more attractive cost. So for example, during non-holiday seasons, uh, it only costs 42 cents per cubic foot. Your FBA storage fee is going to be 87 cents per cubic foot uh, during the non-holiday season. So even that is is about a 50% savings if you're using uh, AWD, or Amazon Warehouse and Distribution. Um, using a 3PL, obviously their costs are going to vary widely depending on who you're using. But my personal 3PL is about three times the price of that for storage. So you can imagine that gets very expensive. I'm actually in the process of switching from my current 3PL to Amazon warehouse and distribution just because I know I, I'm gonna save about 60 to 70% of my uh, of my storage fees. Um, in addition to that, this offers, if you have your bulk product stored in AWD, you can set up auto replenishments. So think about how often you know your products might go out of stock, you forget to ship in new units, or you see a spike in sales, and it just takes a long time for your products to get from your 3PL to be available in Amazon. It is really nice that you can really set this and forget it. Um, Amazon will automatically ship in your products as they see you're getting low um, on your FBA inventory. So it's a huge benefit um, it saves a lot of time, and it's something that you should certainly consider uh, if you haven't already. This is a new program as of 2023. Um, so a lot of people, and, you know, I've talked to a lot of sellers that haven't heard of it or haven't looked into it yet. So this is definitely something that you should have on your radar and can likely save you uh, a lot of money in the long run. So next, I'm going to talk about the transparency program. So this somewhat relates to GS1 that uh, Shane is going to talk about later. Um, but as you know, I'm not sure if anybody has had issues with hijackings or counterfeit products. Um, personally, I have not had to deal with that too much, luckily. Uh, but I've talked to a lot of Amazon sellers who have. I'm currently working with somebody who um, produced a new, a new product uh, late last year. They had an excellent uh, start to this year. Uh, they're doing over 100,000 a month in sales with just 
uh, one product with two variations. And so this is really a key target for hijackers and counterfeits. When they see a product take off and start selling really well, um, th those are the types of products that often get attacked by, by counterfeiters. Um, if you just have your UPC code, that can be stolen and you know printed on a counterfeit product and shipped into Amazon. This happens, um, or it can happen quite frequently. The transparency program uh, was designed to sort of combat this issue. Essentially what it is, is a additional uh, barcode that is provided by Amazon that is unique to your manufacturing batch and has is unique to each product. So let's say you're manufacturing a thousand units, you would enroll in the transparency program. Amazon would provide you with 1000 unique barcodes that you would have printed and pasted onto all of your products. And that way, nothing that uh, no other counterfeit product that doesn't have access to these codes, because you would be the only one with access to these codes. So nobody else could ship in in products and list them under your same listing and, and really, you know, try to undercut you on price and also sell a, a counterfeit product. You know, the, there are a lot of issues with that. Um, you, you might get bad reviews, which are really hard to get off your product listing, uh, but also you're just going to lose your buy box and lose sales over time. That's uh, one of the most challenging parts. So. Uh, transparency has been in effect since 2017. There are over 33,000 Amazon sellers currently using it. Um, I don't think it, you know it's not required for everybody, but there are certain types of products, you know, maybe high-ticket items, new launches that have taken off really well that sort of become targets of, of these, you know, hijackers and counterfeiters. Um, so let's talk about the cost, because uh, I'm sure you know that's always going to be part of the consideration. Um, it costs between one cent to five cent per barcode. Um, I, I'm speaking with a team at Transparency at Amazon, and they do have deals if you're new to sign up. And on average, you can get uh, the cost down to about two cents per unit. So if you think you're about to do a thousand unit production run, that would roughly cost you $20. So again, it's not a huge price tag for you know, the peace of mind that nobody else can list products. Um, on your product listing, and nobody can sell counterfeit products uh, on your Amazon detail page. Uh, so certainly something to consider, uh, especially for larger, more advanced sellers. Um, yeah, I, I would highly re recommend this, this program, especially if you've had issues with counterfeiting in the past. Um, okay, so the next section I want to talk about, and this is actually a change. It's uh, the small and light program is actually ending at the end of August 29th. So if you don't know what the small and light program is, I'll give you a quick overview. Essentially, what it was, was a program where if your product was less than $12 and it was you know, a certain size range, so essentially the small standard size for Amazon, which is rough, you know, it's about 15 by 12 by a quarter of an inch. So basically any product can fit into an Amazon poly, uh, poly mailer bag. Um, anyways. You could enroll in the small and light program uh, to save on your fulfillment fees. Fulfillment fees would go from, you know, at, at the lowest level, if you had a four ounce product or less, your normal FBA fee will be about $3.22. After you enrolled in the small and light program, you could get your FBA fee down to $2.15. So that was more than a 30% uh, reduction in your FBA fee, which, you know, that can be significant if you're doing serious volume. The problem was that the small and light program also removed your prime eligibility. Uh, they did not guarantee two-day shipping. Um, so a lot of times we'd see conversion rates start to drop if you enrolled in the small and light program. Um, it depended on the type of product. You know, so for example, I have a customer who sells greeting cards, you know, birthday cards, uh, Christmas cards, that type of thing. Um, when you're buying a birthday card, if you're like me, you're probably doing it last minute and you want it to arrive in a day or two. So that was one of the pitfalls of the small and light program for specific products that, you know, people would tend to like more quickly. Um, so at the end of the month, August 29th, small and light program is getting thrown out. The, there's a new program um, called FBA or low price FBA. Just essentially any product that is below ten dollars 
automatically gets enrolled to low price FBA, assuming their product is the right size and uh, there are different pricing tiers based on the weight of the product. So this will, if you were not enrolled in FBA before and your product, is, or if you were not enrolled in the small and light program and your product was $3 and you know, 22 cents for your FBA fees, that is automatically going to drop to $2 and 45 cents. So that's a 77 cent uh, saving per product. I have one customer who is going to save over five to $6,000 per month just on this switch because they're selling you know, thousands and thousands of SIM cards per month. Um, if you were already enrolled in small and light, your fulfillment fees are gonna go up slightly by about you know, 30 cents, or is about $2.15 for the lowest tier of small and light. So we will see uh, if you were enrolled in that program, your, your fulfillment fees will go up slightly, but you will also now be eligible for Prime. All of these product, products will be low price FBA rate, will be Prime eligible, one to two day shipping, depending on where you live in the country. Um, so it's good to know, it's good to understand this, to think about your product pricing. If you're pricing your product at $11 and you qualify for the low price FBA rate, um, you're essentially losing money on that transaction. So you should instead you know, price your product at $9.99 or $10. So you can take advantage of this. Anyways, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about a new product that Mayan just recently, recently launched. It's called our Inventory Optimization Dashboard. Uh, this is a great tool for Amazon sellers. I've been using it. Uh, all of our customers have really enjoyed it and have been giving us great feedback. But essentially, it lets you see which products need uh, attention immediately, which products are out of stock, which products are running out of stock, going to be out of stock in the next uh, 30 days, which products have a healthy inventory level, which is usually between 60 to 90 days, and then which products are overstocked how long have they been overstocked? Maybe there's an opportunity to liquidate some of your products or you know, create a removal order so that you're not paying the uh, FBA storage fees um, for your overstocked items. This is currently free. Um, it is our only free product offering. So I strongly recommend that you know everybody uh, really jump on board right now because I, it's not gonna be free forever. And just like our ebook, there will be um, a cost to this eventually. So get locked in, get grandfathered in at the free rate now. Um, that's all I have for my section, and I am going to turn it over to Rohit from Assureful. Take it away. Thank you so much. So um, Assureful, you know, who are we? What do we do? How are we different? Uh, Assureful is uh, an insurance provider. We are not brokers. Uh, we are the underwriters. So essentially what that means is that we don't take um, your file. When Amazon tells you to go and buy insurance because you've crossed the threshold of $10,000 in one month, uh, and Amazon says you must now have insurance, we don't take it and then uh, send it out to five different insurance companies and try and get a quote for you because that system is broken and it's just the broker that's in incentivized. Uh, in that process. What we do instead is we're the underwriters. So we make the decision uh, and how we do it is that we do it by connecting to your seller accounts uh, and we're the only company who can rate price and underwrite insurance monthly based on your actual sales in the last 30 days. Uh, case in point, when uh, one of my brands, we had projected sales of 30 million on Amazon uh, and we were selling probiotics at the time, uh, we had a suspension event. So all insurance companies require you to project your sales for the next uh, 12 months and say, what are you going to sell and how much of it are you going to sell in the next 12 months? Um, and that's how your insurance is reached and priced. So in my case, we projected 30 million in sales. We had a suspension event that took our sales down to 9 million for the year. So I went back to my insurance company and I said, you know, hey, can we get uh, a refund, please, or a discount? Because we didn't hit 30 million in sales. In fact, we didn't even hit a third of it. And the insurance company said, not my problem, not going to cover it, not going to give you uh, a reduction in um, or a discount. And that really upset me, and which is why I founded Assureful. At Assureful, 
We are fully compliant with Amazon's requirements, Walmart's requirements. So Amazon requires a million dollars uh, with a cap on the deductible that can be charged uh, and also um, you know, certain reporting requirements. So we're fully compliant there. And also with Walmart, who needs $2 million in limits. Um, we uh, are able to produce both occurrence and claims made policies. I'm going into the weeds, but uh, just safe to say that we are compliant fully with Amazon and Walmart. We don't just cover your products that are sold only on Amazon. You might have your own Shopify store or other e-commerce store. We cover that as well as all your other, um, you might have distributors or wholesale channels that you're selling through. At Assurefo, we cover 100% of your sales. One of the big problems that third-party sellers face is um, they're either over-projecting annually to their insurance company or under-projecting. If you over-project, you're overpaying for insurance. And if you under-project, if you say that, you know, I'm going to do only, you know, 100K, but you end up doing 125K for the year, um, the last 25K is uninsured. And what that means is when a claim comes through the door, and typically claims always come through the door, especially if you're selling um, on Amazon.com or in the US, it's it's very litigious as a market. So uh, when you do get a claim come through the door, the insurer will see when that product was purchased. And if it was beyond the 100K uh, projection that you made, it's uninsured, leading to uh, you being open to direct exposure, lawsuits, bankruptcy, et cetera. It's, it's super risky. So which is where a shortfall, you know, does it on a pay as you sell basis, you know, so you don't have to do premium financing either with us because, because we're monthly billed, uh, there's no, you know, huge payment up front, uh, which you're trying to amortize over the rest of the year based on your actual sales. We're always based on your real sales. Um, some other key differences is that we cover products made in China. We cover products that are private label. Most insurers won't do it. Essentially, we cover 95% of all products sold on Amazon, right? Most insurers will probably do 40, 50% of products uh, sold on Amazon, maybe. Um, and, and the last thing to note here is that uh, the insurance we provide is A-rated, which is, again, Amazon's requirements. Uh, so we always pay. Uh, we make sure to you know, protect the uh, third-party seller who is our customer. Uh, and, um, yeah, we look after them. So um, it's not just product liability, which is Amazon's requirement. We can also support you with all your insurance requirements as well, which includes, um, uh, you know, goods and transit insurance, if that's what you need, or... Um, property if you have commercial property that you're uh, renting so um now i just want to talk about what the insurance requirements are and what has amazon said so amazon keeps changing its insurance requirements um until recently the insurance requirement was you must have had a hundred thousand dollars in sales in uh the last 12 months then amazon dropped it to five thousand dollars for three consecutive months where it is today is $10,000 in one month. And that could be a bump in sales for Prime Day or Black Friday or um, any other promo that you're running. If it exceeds $10,000 in one month, from that point on, you must have insurance. And if you go into Seller Central and look up the insurance requirements, you will see how detailed it is, uh, that the requirements that Amazon has. Um, they need an occurrence-based policy. They need, um, you know, a million dollars in aggregate, and the deductible cannot exceed ten thousand uh, dollars. And that, you know, you could be anchor selling a billion dollars worth of product on Amazon, and you'd still have your deductible capped at ten thousand dollars, which is, uh, which is crazy because it makes it really expensive with most other insurance companies. Um, and also you have to name Amazon as an additional insured. Now, what that means is, is in the event that a lawsuit comes through the door, right, for a product that you're selling, say, for example, you're selling headphones and um, wireless headphones and the lithium-ion battery burns a table or uh, causes some personal injury to somebody, uh, the your customer, the end customer, is going to 
say, where did I buy the product from? And their you know, personal injury lawyers are going to say, where did you buy it? I bought it on Amazon. So they will name Amazon uh, on the lawsuit that is issued to you. Now, when that happens, Amazon says, we're only a marketplace. We are not uh, the seller and they'll point the finger at you, but they want to be indemnified and they want to be sure that they wouldn't be dragged into it as well, which is why we name Amazon as an additional insured as standard if you're selling on Amazon. Um, and yeah, so these are sort of the basic Amazon insurance requirements, which you can see uh, in uh, within Seller Central. So please take a look at it. It's very important. Amazon is suspending sellers who don't have appropriate insurance. And this is very important to note. Amazon will give you a notice and tell you to buy insurance within 30 days. They will direct you to an insurance accelerator. Uh, whoever is on the insurance accelerator, the odds are they will reject uh, anything that you're selling if it is A, not made in the US, B, is private label, they will most likely reject it. And so give us a call. Go to shuffle.com and we should be able to cover you that on a monthly build usage basis. Um, what happens if you don't have insurance or the wrong type of insurance? Obviously, Amazon is going to suspend you. Uh, Amazon will give you a chance. They will tell you that there's, this is your opportunity to go and buy insurance. You have crossed the $10,000 threshold and will ask you to buy compliant insurance. Uh, you will submit it. If you buy insurance somewhere else and you submit it to Amazon, um, the odds are, you know, seller support isn't going to come back to you for 30 days. And when they do come back to you and tell you that you've bought the wrong insurance, uh, which most insurance companies will either jack up the deductible or not provide the right limits or not name Amazon. Um, at that point, you have already crossed what is known as an earned premium within uh, the insurance companies parlance and so you wouldn't be able to get a refund from your insurance company which means you'll have to buy another insurance policy to satisfy amazon or they will suspend you uh, and amazon has kind of been lax around suspension so far however there have been a ton of lawsuits that have been uh, that amazon has been party to around you know faulty um, power banks and um uh, most gated categories or most gated products on Amazon, it's because they gated because they've had a lawsuit come through the door. And so they want additional compliance and requirements. Uh, but, you know, these lawsuits come through for, we had a client who was selling um, aloe vera gel. And uh, aloe vera gel, uh, one of the end customers burnt their leg on a um, space heater and applied the aloe vera gel and uh, because the aloe vera gel didn't cure the client, the, the end customer, they uh, sued for a million dollars and named Amazon in it as well. So it's just, it's a highly litigious market, uh, especially if you're selling on Amazon in the US and you need to be protected. You, it's just good practice. You know, even if you don't hit the thresholds, it is good practice. And at a shortfall, you know, our monthly premiums start off at $26 for sellers who are small. So it's it's a no brainer, really. Um, and if you uh, get in touch with us at assureful.com, uh, we will do a free insurance audit, make sure and advise you and also give you 10 percent off on your first month's insurance. But uh, let us know where you heard it from and uh, and you could be eligible for up to 10 percent off on your first month's insurance. So uh, happy to take any questions at the end. Yeah. I have a quick question for you just while we're on the topic. How does your billing cycle work? So if you're only um, covering exactly what you sold, are you billing at the end of every month once you know exactly how much revenue was produced by the customer? Right. So our billing cycle works on the basis of sign up date, right? So uh, assume you're signing up on uh, the 10th of August, 2023. On the 10th of September, you will get an invoice and you would be charged for your sales between 10th of August and 10th of September, and so on from there. So that's how our billing cycle works. Great. Okay. Yeah, good to know. I'm actually in the process of uh, getting a free quote with the Shurful now, so I'm excited to see, um, see how it works out. 
fantastic. And let us know about uh, that you work for Mayan and we'll make sure you get the 10% off in the first month. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, thank you so much. All right, next up we have Shane with GS1, take it away. No, thank you so much and great job, Andrew and Rohit. Um, very interesting uh, in information that you gave. All right, because GS1 US is not for profit neutral, we have to show you our antitrust caution. And this basically just states that we don't talk about industry pricing or other competitive topics. Always remember that uh, to make your own bus business decisions, our standards are voluntary and they're not mandatory. And then this is our legal disclosure, which states that everything you're about to hear and read is for educational purposes only. So with that being said, my name is Shane Morris, as they said, and I'm going to give you an introduction into who GS1 US is. But I want to begin to, and make everybody aware that we are actually a member organization. So we love an opportunity to get in front of our members or prospective members. And, um, uh, you know, we always love that opportunity. So to start out, um, a, a great book for anybody in business to read is um, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in, for habit number two, he has you go through this exercise to begin with the end in mind. So if you were applying this habit to your business and visualize where you want your business to be when you retire, exit, or pass it on to future generations, what would it look like? When you think of it this way, the options all of a sudden become limitless. You can apply this habit to your business no matter what stage you're in. So whether you're just entering the game or you've been doing it for a few years, if you begin with the end in mind, what this will do is it may influence your decision making and serve as a guide to make decisions that are built on a foundation that can support growth and scale from the beginning, but also endure to the end. <clears throat> so a good question you can ask yourself when beginning with the end in mind is where do you want to be? We all know how the internet has democratized a brand's ability to get into the market and that Amazon is probably one of the greatest business incubators in the world. At GS1 US, 80% of our new membership is coming from small business. Many of these are starting out online. And this confirms to us that brands are more likely to go digital first and then are branching out to multiple channels and international markets at a historically faster pace than before. But as you can also see from the stats on this slide, in order to be competitive, a brand needs to build a foundation in their business processes that will enable them to quickly execute not only in a digital environment, but in a physical environment as well, if that time comes. As an Amazon seller, your strategy may be to only sell on Amazon, but this should not preclude you from taking the necessary steps at the right stages to ensure your brand and your products are positioned to scale across various channels. Because whether or not you have an opportunity to sell into a national retailer, or you receive a 6X offer from a potential buyer, they're wanting, they're, they are gonna want to know that your brand is retail ready. So if we were to step back and look at all the things that new business needs to do in order to get started, a lot of things on this list, list probably look very familiar. After doing your market research and putting a business plan together, there are things a business needs to do in order to set a solid foundation. This list doesn't show everything, but it does show some of the primary tasks you should consider when starting your business. We have insurance on there, Rohi. Um, of all the things to consider on this list, I'm here today to talk to you about why it's necessary to get your membership, your GTINs, and your UPCs from the retail industry's trusted source. So for online businesses, GS1 standards help bridge the gap between the physical and digital world. So in the crowded endless aisles, search engines, marketplaces, shopping engines, and retailers rely on these standards for the millions of products that they're indexing in order to accurately identify items and return accurate search results to the consumer. I'm gonna uh, tell you a few important points that you may not know about um, why an online business should have GS1 identifiers. Um, so Google actually advocates for brands to associate a GS1 G10 with your product listing on Google Shopping because it significantly improves impressions and conversions and can boost your SEO. A GS1 issued G10 is required to list on many marketplaces, including Amazon and Walmart, along with most national um, retailer e-commerce platforms. Um, understanding and utilizing GS1 case pack labels and logistics standards can help you properly label cartons for speedy intake, warehousing, and pick and pack at your 3PL. And they can eventually help you grow efficiencies with systems like EDI. 
And this one common product identifier that works globally is a powerful tool for uniting sales and inventory data across the various channels and systems in that digital supply chain. Oh. There we go, that's the slide I'm looking for. <laughs> In reality, the largest benefit to adopting GS1 standards for a growing brand are the many doors that they can open with new marketplaces and retailers globally, many of whom rely on GS1 standards to do business with vendors and sellers of all sizes. So pictured here are just a few examples of vendor guidelines requiring the use of um, GS1 standards. So now that I've given you some context about why so many organizations put their trust in us, I am gonna just give you a brief um, overview of who we are. So we are actually, like I said, a supply chain standards organization. We were formed back in the early 70s within the grocery industry. And what we were there to help them solve were long lines at checkout and pricing um, confusion at point of sale. Everything was done manually. The solve for those problems back then is how most people know of us as we are the issuer and, and administer of the UPC barcode, which believe it or not is a key cornerstone of the global supply chain. We're also a not-for-profit, industry-driven and neutral organization. And why this designation is important is because it allows all stakeholders within an industries um, and the, all the industries that we serve to have an impartial organization to help them su su um, solve supply chain problems that impact the entire industry through the use of our standards. So one thing I always like audiences to understand that it doesn't matter how big or small you are, if you are sourcing, manufacturing, importing, warehousing, and shipping product into the global market, you are a stakeholder of that global supply chain and um, you, you, we're here to serve you. Um, so as a global supply chain standards organization, we maintain, um, develop and maintain the most widely used supply chain standards in the world. Our organization is federated, so GS1 US oversees members and partners that are operating in the US, but there's 116 um, GS1 member organizations that serve businesses in their countries and geographical areas. Um, GS1 standards are used by over 2 million user companies worldwide, and these companies generate over 10 billion transactions daily using our standards. So I think a lot of times we sit there and we, we throw out standards a lot and uh, somebody who's selling on Amazon is like, well, what, what are these standards? So I'm just going to briefly go over this. So the, the GS1, we have a system of standards and these were designed to help businesses become globally interoperable with one another. So everybody in that supply chain is speaking one language, which is a numbering of all things in the supply chain. So this includes companies, locations, products, and logistic units to name a few. Once things are identified, we have standardized data carriers to capture this information. So think of the UPC barcode as a data carrier. And then if you need to share this data across uh, with your trading partners, we have standardized formats and platforms to share it across the supply chain as well. In the e-commerce environment, it really comes down to the product. So the global trade item number or G10 is an identifier that identifies a product down to its variant level. It's sometimes referred to as a UPC or EAN but that's the number you're gonna find embedded in those barcodes. GS1 standards are technology agnostic, meaning you can take and embed that G10 in that UPC barcode, but they can also be embedded in a, a web page meta tag, in a marketplace listing like you do, um, even a blockchain. So no matter the carrier, the G10 will serve as the product license plate and uniquely identify that exact item variant in the physical and digital supply chains. I always like to, reinforce that each G10 is globally unique. They're never replicated, and they're also linked to the licensing company and stored in the GS1 Global Registry. So the question comes up from Amazon sellers all the time is, what if my G10 didn't come from GS1? And so I'm gonna explain it kind of from Amazon's perspective. One of the key features of the GS1 system of standards is a product's verifiability through our global registry. And this allows marketplaces and retailers to confirm a product is authentic and is linked to the listing company. The benefits of this for a marketplace is it removes product duplication on their platform, it prevents hijacking and counterfeit, and it promotes consumer safety and transparency. Um, you know, the net is, is the marketplaces and retailer communities only have to go to one source of truth for verifying products and um, companies. 
So I'm just going to talk a just I'm I'm just going to go over this briefly about some of the acronyms that often need clarification. So one of those is is a G10 the same as a UPC? Because when you look at some of those retailer guidelines that I showed you and on Amazon and Google, they refer to both, um, and they're not the same. And here's why: so a UPC is a universal product code, and that's the barcode you see on this image here, the black lines and spaces. The G10 is that number that is embedded um, underneath that barcode, and that's the thing that I uniquely identifies that trade item. So again, many retailer partners refer to G10s and UPCs interchangeably. We do the same thing here. Um, and then, you know, for lip for specifically listing on Amazon, you know, when you're if you're uploading a template, you're gonna ask to put in your product identifier and then the column next to it, you're gonna be presented with EAN UPC or G10. So G uh, UPC, what we call a UPC 12, what Amazon calls a UPC. Um, that is going to be a 12-digit number, and you're you're gonna you, you get those either out of GS1 US or GS1 Canada in North America. The G the EAN that's going to be a 13-digit identifier. We call it the G1013. That's going to be issued out of pretty much anywhere else in the world, Europe, South America. They work globally and they're interchangeably globally, but they're just different digit numbers. And the G10, what they list as a G10, what we call a G10 G1014. That's going to identify cases. So if you're selling cases on Amazon of things, which a lot of people do, that's when you would use the G10. Most likely here in the U.S., you're going to be using selecting UPC. Um, another thing that we've found is a, a request for a G10 from Amazon or Google is a lot of times the first place a new business encounters GS1 and our standards. And they often wonder what their options are. And even if you're an experienced seller, sometimes you come to license more G10s and we have a couple of options and people don't necessarily know what specifically a prefix is. So I'm gonna explain that a little bit. So we've got a couple of different options, either a prefix or a single G10. So if you license a GS1 company prefix, this allows your business to select essentially a bulk quantity of G10s that align with your product assortment. So they can be licensed in quantities from 10 to 100,000. This is a great choice for a well-established business, brands with large product assortments, or those scaling their product lines quickly. The unique prefix number is also used for some of our other identity keys, like a serialized shipping container code or a global location number. And these are GS1 identifiers that are often required by national chains and can only be generated through a GS1 company prefix. So Take that into consideration when making business decisions and beginning with the end in mind. Now, since 2020, GS1 US now allows businesses to license single G10s, which are a perfect entry point for new or small businesses or those with only a few products. Single auction has been a game changer for new businesses who are beginning to explore a standardized approach to their business. It's a one-time fee and there's no annual, uh, so you know, it's a one-time payment, there's no annual fee. So those are your options. And then I'm going to just talk a little bit about how assigning those G10s, how you have to think about it. So G10 should be assigned at the variant level. This graphic um, can help you understand how a brand actually might need more G10s than they think. You know, it's important to consider the future growth of product lines, the number of sizes, colors, fragrances, flavors or, um, uh, that a product's going to come in, either, either now or what it's going to scale to. You also need to think about your packaging. So will you have multi-packs? Will you have specialty holiday packs? Because these are going to also require different G10s. And additionally, you should consider how you might bundle products to create unique offerings that appeal to different customer profiles on like Amazon versus Walmart or your direct-to-consumer sites. And these bundles uh, might require unique G10s if they're pre-packaged. So whether you look at this graphic and see a large variety of product in your future, or you just have a few items in your five-year plan, we have an option for you. And again, if you're selling into a national retailer, if that's in your strategy, um, they may have guidelines that require that GS1 company prefix over a single G10, so just take that into consideration. So <clears throat> this is our getting a G10 or a prefix from us is easy. You just go to our um, website. The, the link is right up there. And when you license either a single or a prefix, you're going to become a GS1 member and GS1 membership has its privileges. And I'm just going to go over one of those for time's sake um, right now. So one key benefit is our data hub um, solution. Um, and this is a free benefit brands receive when licensing either a prefix or a single. 
And when you log in for the first time, those that prefix or that single G10 is going to be in there waiting for you. Now, from there, you can go in and set up your new products um, and assign core attributes. So these are attributes that are going to live with your product, even in your proprietary catalog. So it's a great place to assign them there. And then you can assign your GTINs to your product in this tool. You can assign them or you can have it just assign them for you. Um, you can even create barcodes in uh, Data Hub for printing if you need these for your packaging. One cool thing that a lot of people don't know about, but you can also create a GS1128 case pack barcode and embed product attributes like um, batch lot numbers or expiration dates. So this label um, can help you and or your 3PL scan these cases in inventory and then also give them visibility into what should be picked first. So a key feature of this tool is you have a centralized repository to store, manage and access all of your G10s. Um, and it's a, it's a very useful tour, uh, tool. So just for sum up here, pre-internet, when the retail industry was operating only in the physical environment, they did identify a need for standards that would enable interoperability between them and their trading partners, and also visibility into all the moving parts of the supply chain, all the way down to the product level. So they leveraged GS1 standards. If we fast forward and look at the digital space, GS1 standards have helped um, solve for identifying, indexing, and returning results for individual products that sit in a sea of billions. They've allowed for e-commerce brands and enablement companies um, of all kinds to leverage solutions like inventory management and fulfillment, among others, in the digital supply chain. Today, retailers in every channel, physical or digital, rely on GS1 standards to solve for more complex challenges in the supply chain. They can help them prevent counterfeit products entering the market to having a clear line of sight for product traceability and, um, and, that, and, and, and that can ensure safety and transparency to the consumer. As a brand, adopting GS1 standards can enable your company to do all of the above, but will also show your current and future trading partners or your potential buyers that your business has a strong foundation for trust, scale, and growth, and that it's retail ready. So this slide here, we appreciate, um, you know, obviously being here. Um, we've just listed out, if you can come to our website, we ask you to come look around. There's a lot of interesting things and you can see all the things that our company does. We do a lot of different things. Um, we've also got a, a great YouTube channel for a great educational content. And then we also have what I think is really cool is a small business spotlight um, YouTube channel where you can see brands like yourself um, that sell on Amazon that have leveraged our standards and have expanded into other segments. So, um, and then let's see here, I've just got this uh, little trademark notices and then there's my contact information and anybody can reach out to me with any questions that they have. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you so much, Shane. I actually do have a quick question for you. And maybe this is something that I've done wrong in the past, but I have uh, one GS1 account with 100, um, 100 UPC codes available. Um, and I've split it between two brands. So my question is, you know, some products are for one brand, some are for another. I control both of them. If I were to sell one of those brands, how would that work? Would I just essentially allow the purchaser to continue to use my UPC codes. I don't necessarily want to give them control of my UPC account if I hold on to one other brand. Or should, did I do something wrong and should I have had two UPC um, accounts in the first yeah. place? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good question and it's a question that comes up often. And, um, you know, where it's really come up a lot is within the aggregator community, you know, as they're out buying brands. But really, you can't with, with it, whatever prefix you buy, so they come in 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, but you can't uh, divest a certain a number of GTINs under that, under that prefix number because, as you notice, that, you know, the first X, you know, probably on yours, probably the first nine digits are your prefix number, and then you put the, you know, the product identifier digits after. So yeah. I don't necessarily think you did anything wrong, but if you did divest that brand, um, they're, they're going to have to get, get a new prefix. Um, so it is something to think about. And we actually kind of coach the aggregator community on when you're, you know, to, to set up brands with different prefixes because they are kind of buying and selling, you know? Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. I uh, appreciate it. Um, anyways, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, advertising audits through Mayan. Again, this is something we offer for free. 
Um, essentially, we have a team that digs into your data. I've presented uh, dozens, if not hundreds of audits over the past two years. Um, so you have a dedicated PPC expert really digging into your account, figuring out where the problems are, figuring out where you're wasting money, and then presenting a plan of how to improve your PPC performance going forward. I, it, it's very, very rare to conduct an audit and not find issues. Uh, there's always something that is not optimized correctly or something you've been spending money on that hasn't been working for your account. And you really have to understand PPC well uh, to identify where the, where the main issues are. So um, feel free to book an audit with Mayan. It's something, uh, again, it's a totally free service, uh, no strings attached, and we can really help you out, figure, you know, figure out if your PPC is, is working well or not. Um, we also, I just want to remind everybody, we have the exclusive offer with the Shurful for 10% off the first month of your insurance. I'm definitely going to be taking advantage of that. Um, and otherwise, I think that is all we have. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, it was, it was uh, great working with you, Shane and Rohit, and we'll be in touch um, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. That was excellent. Thank you. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. Bye.